Hello, welcome to our study of the Gospel of Mark. We are beginning chapter 7 today. But before we start, how about we pray? That's always a good place to start. Father, I thank you so much again today for your word. We thank you that you were active, you were uh, present in the ministry of Jesus, uh, that you filled him with your Holy Spirit, that he, the eternal uh, Son of God, became incarnate, lived as one of us, and walked around throughout Galilee, Judea, Samaria, even edging out of the land. Lord, help us to listen to him today, to learn from him as we read your word. Give us insight, not just to fill our brains with knowledge, but to transform us, to make us more like Jesus. Amen. Now, let's go ahead and throw our text up here on the screen so we can look at that. Uh, this is a long, involved text today. So we're going to be looking at several parts here. Let's get to the right screen here. Here we begin. Uh, the Pharisees and some of the teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus and saw some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. The Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing, holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And they observe many other traditions, such as the washing of cups, pitchers, and kettles. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live, in accord, uh, live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? So my, my first question here, and, and if you're joining us for the first time today, uh, my approach to this particular Bible study is asking questions. Read the text, look at the task, text, ask questions of the text. My first question today is, how did, the, how did the Pharisees know the disciples were eating with unwashed hands? Was, was it that their hands looked unwashed? Was it they could look at them and say, ooh, yeah, there's yucky dirt on your hands? Or were they wash, watching them all the time and seeing them out doing things, out involved in life, in the marketplace, as we see mentioned later in verse 4? And they never saw them washing their hands, or at least not washing their hands the way the Pharisees themselves did it. Uh, maybe some of us are used to this kind of situation where we have people that are monitoring us, that are keeping a close eye on us. Uh, watching for us to fail, watching for us to stumble, watching for us to do what they consider to be the wrong thing. How does that influence us? Does that build us up? Does that strengthen us? In my own life, I know it's, it's to my advantage to have a group of people that hold me accountable to doing the right thing. Uh, that happens within my family. My, my wife is a, is a great blessing to me in that area. And uh, I know sometimes I am really thankful in the moment when she holds me accountable. Other times I get pretty grouchy because I don't like to be held accountable. Well, I, I, I want to want to be held accountable, but I don't always want it in the moment. Sometimes I just I hear it as her trying to annoy me, trying to, to make me like her but it's good for me to have that voice in my life calling me to account. Or I'm also part of a band meeting. I meet with a couple of guys every week. We, we encourage each other. We pray for each other. and We confess our sins to each other. They also work to hold me accountable, to call me to account. So, yeah, it's good to have that. But the, but the disciples and the Pharisees here, the Pharisees, as far as I can tell, were not looking out for the disciples' best interests. It looks like in this context, they were trying to trip Jesus up. And we'll get to more questions on that in just a minute. Uh, the second question I, I wonder about here is, does it matter that it was only some of Jesus' disciples? Because we see there in verse 2, and they saw some of, Jesus, some of his disciples. It doesn't say all of his disciples or one of his disciples, but some of his disciples eating food with hands that were defiled that is unwashed. Does it make any difference that it was only some? Were there some of the disciples there that were more fastidious, like the Pharisees, 
who, who practiced the same hand-washing rituals that the Pharisees did. I mean, if that's possible, then, then it looks like Jesus might have had a mixed group of disciples here, some of whom were maybe Pharisaic in their background. Maybe some that thought that those traditions of the elders, we're going to look at that shortly, were, were very important, were essential. Jesus, however, as far as we can see here, is tolerant. Jesus doesn't really care which rituals they're doing. We don't see Jesus offering a rebuke to the disciples that are not washing their hands after the manner of the Pharisees. We also don't see Jesus offering a rebuke to the disciples who are doing it the right way, according to the Pharisees. Jesus doesn't come in and say, hey, guys, that's what the Pharisees do. We're not Pharisees, so you're free from doing all that. So don't do it anymore. No, for Jesus, it sure looks like this is a matter that is indifferent. What, what we theologians might call adiaphora things that don't matter. Yeah, there, there might be an advantage, but maybe not. So we don't know. So if you want to do it, do it. But it's not a make or break issue. Uh, question three, why did the Pharisees bother Jesus with this issue? What problem did they think comes from eating with unwashed hands? Now, the Pharisees in the Gospels show a consistent pattern of challenging Jesus. They can't challenge him directly. They challenge him indirectly. This is an indirect challenge. Jesus, if you knew what your disciples were doing, you would stop them. You would correct them. You would make them do the right thing. Well, maybe. Maybe that's how the Pharisees were with their disciples. Maybe they were fastidious. Maybe they were enforcing correct behavior, uh, correct actions on the part of their disciples to make sure they always did the right thing. Well, at least in public, always do the right thing in public. Behind closed doors, mm, maybe not matter so much. Now, I think the Pharisees were, were pretty diligent on this. And I, I, I know Jesus calls them hypocrites at various times, but... I think they're hypocrites in, in what they chose to focus on, not necessarily in their heart. Maybe, well, we'll look at that at another time when we look at Jesus directly challenging the Pharisees without being instigated by the Pharisees. But the Pharisees are here trying to trip up Jesus. Who, who are some people in our world today that are trying to trip us up, who are trying to trip up believers, who are watching what we do? saying, oh, if you were really Christians, or if you were really godly, if you were really good people, you wouldn't do that. Or if, if you're really godly, if you're really good people, you would do this other thing. There are people out there. How do we approach them? How do we hear what they have to say? Uh, in, in our case, a lot of times I'm trying to win them over. Uh, I, I believe uh, that everybody is winnable. So I, I take the attitude of, of Paul in 1 Corinthians 9, where he says, to the weak, I became weak. To the strong, I became strong. To, to the Gentiles, I acted like a Gentile. To the Jews, I acted like a Jew. Now, there were boundaries for Paul that we see there. Uh, there were lines he would not cross to do that. But there were all important aspects in his life that he was willing to do whatever it took to reach people. So, yeah, people have questioned me. I try to stand up for Jesus and what he would do, but also have room for disagreement, room for differences. Question four, why does Mark go into so much detail explaining the content of the Pharisees' concerns? Why does he say nothing about the rationale for their concern? My first thought here is that Mark must be writing for an audience that doesn't know the Pharisees. So he's not writing primarily for a Palestinian Jewish audience. Chances are Mark is writing maybe for a Gentile audience. Uh, they're the ones that are most likely to lack understanding, the background understanding necessary to know why Pharisees would even bring this up. Why would there even be traditions about washing hands at meals or 
washing cups, pitters, pitchers, and kettles. So I think this is a clue toward uh, Mark's audience here. Question five, what is the relation between the traditions of the elders and the Old Testament? Or we, we could say maybe more broadly today as we look to apply this in, in our context, what's the relation between the traditions of the elders and the Bible? What's, what's the relationship between the way we've always done things and the Bible? Sometimes there's an overlap. Frequently, we like to offer biblical support, biblical rationales for what we've always done. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, we humans are by nature a conservative lot. And by conservative, I, I don't mean conservative in terms of modern political ideologies. Uh, I mean, we're pretty stuck in our ways. Uh, I mean, especially in church, if you have any experience in a church environment or in other environments that are similar, uh, every Sunday, people come in, they tend to sit in the same spot. They think of it as this is my spot. This is my seat. And fortunately, I think my current congregation is beyond defending their seat. If they come in and find a visitor sitting in their seat, I, I don't, I think most of our people, fortunately, I hope, are beyond coming up to a visitor and saying, you're sitting in my seat, move. I've been in churches where that's happened and it breaks my heart. Uh, our calling in, in worship, in public worship is to welcome people, to bring them in, to give them the best seats. Now, the best seat is relative. Some people think the best seat is way up front so you can see and hear best. In our culture, a lot of people think the best seat is the back row or as close to the back as you can get. But for me, if, if I'm sitting out there in the pews and somebody's sitting in the seat I regularly sit in, I'm going to let them have it because, hey, wow, they're here. Glad to have them. Now, of course, in, in that regard, I also try to make a habit when I'm in the congregation is sitting in a different place every time. Now, if you've tried that, whether in church or in a classroom setting or business meeting, you know, that can be pretty challenging. You have to consciously think of it because we're conservative beings. We get in patterns, we get in ruts. We do the things over and over again. My, my prayer for us as Christians, my prayer for us as a church is that we give more credence, we give more authority to the Bible than to the traditions of the elders, to the way we've always done things. Uh, the way we've always done things can be really good, really helpful, can be perfectly in line with scripture. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it keeps us from obeying God. In this situation here, their fixation, the Pharisees' fixation on these traditions of the elders is keeping them away from God, keeping them from experience, experiencing Jesus. Uh, question six, what are, uh, are there things the disciples of Jesus do today that would cause people to question Jesus? Would those be primarily insiders? Those like the Pharisees that, that have a relationship to us similar to that? or outsiders, people who have no connection to church life or Christian life at all? That's a good question. What, what do you all think there? Uh, if, if you're watching online, uh, share something in the comments about things that, that we do today that might cause people to ask questions and say, hey, Jesus, why do your people do that? Or why do they not do this? Uh, let's go to the next part here. Uh, Another question I have here is, how do we differentiate between the commands of God and human traditions, given cultural and temporal distance? Because we look at the Old Testament, and it's not hard to find commands there in the Bible that are extremely distant from us culturally. They, they don't fit our context anymore. I mean, just think about the laws of cleanness 
the laws of purity, the laws of sacrifice, all of that. Now, that's not our culture anymore. As Christians, there's a lot of ways in which we're beyond that. We're going to see that further in what we see in this text today. Good question for us. Let's look at six through eight. Jesus replied, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites. Here's Jesus calling the Pharisees hypocrites. As it is written, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. And there's Jesus right there in the end, honing in on the last question I asked. You have let go of the commands of God and are holding on to human traditions. Where is it in our lives today that we are holding on to the way we've always done things and forgetting the commands of God? really pray that, that we don't do that, that we minimize that. Uh, question here, uh, uh, question eight, how much of the larger context of Isaiah 29 should we imagine Jesus is pointing toward with this quotation from verse 13 of Isaiah 29? Verse 14 in Isaiah uh, 29 goes on to talk about astounding the people with wonders and thwarting the wisdom of the wise. And, and I'm asking this question because when you look at Jesus, Jesus is astounding the people with wonders, with miracles, with things they've never seen before. And he is thwarting the wisdom of the wise. The Pharisees are those who are accounted wise. And yet Jesus, through what he says, through what he does, through the way he's operating, through the way he calls disciples, leads them, trains them, apprentices them, is thwarting the wisdom of the wise. Uh, question nine, what's the difference between honoring God with our lips and honoring with our hearts? Are, are we honoring God just with what we say, whether it's what we say about ourselves, whether it's the way that we, like the Pharisees, are challenging and provoking other people with their failures of righteousness, their failures of obedience, their failures of propriety? I mean, I have to watch this as a professional Christian, one who gets up and talks in front of people. I, I do a lot of lip service. I have to make sure that what I do with my lips, what I say, is in line with the commands of God, that I honor God with my heart. Are you concerned about this in your own life? Are you concerned about having your heart and your mouth say the same things so that your heart honors God in every in every way at all times. Question 10, how can we maintain faithfulness in particular areas without missing out on what God is doing now? We have fundamental obedience to God that we wanna do in our lives. We look to scripture for a huge amount of that, major components. What is God up to? What, is, what does God want us to do? What does is, what is the life in Christ look like? And it's obeying what we see in the past, putting into practice what we see in the past is hugely important there. The Pharisees were right about that. But the Pharisees were missing out on what God was doing then and there. What do we need to do to be faithful to what God has set in the past, and yet not miss what God's doing now. That might be on a new tangent, might be something different. It's a challenge there. I think one of the areas the church has faced that in the last generation is in worship, in worship styles and worship music and how we do worship. Huge questions to ask there. Something that we need to continually remember. Question 11. Which commands of God are we prone to set aside? What caused the Pharisees and others throughout the ages to practice selective obedience? Yeah, that's a huge challenge for us in every age, for believers in every age. There are commands that we like, commands that we find congenial to our nature, commands that we say, oh yeah, we're on board with those. And, and it might be because we're Christians, and we're in the word and we're convinced of the truth of it. It might be that it's just 
comports with our with our cultural training, with the way we were brought up, with what's going on around us, with what's comfortable, with what works well. But what commands in your experience are you prone to set aside? What, looking at the church around you, maybe, maybe your, your congregation or the church in your country, what are some commands of God that we're prone to set aside? I mean, maybe... Uh, love to the poor, provision for the poor. Uh, I know in, in the time of slavery here in America, they're pretty prone to putting aside the, the commands of God regarding the way we treat people and love each other. I mean, we even rationalize, oh yeah, having slaves, we're loving them because, man, if, if we didn't have a slaves, they'd just be sort of poor and helpless. So yeah, we're being very careful here. So we care for people. Uh, let's go on to the next section here, 9 through 13. Jesus continued, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is korban, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And you do many things like that. So here are the Pharisees nullifying, setting aside the commands of God. Jesus says you even set up systems that make it easier for people to set aside the commands of God. Here, here it is, loving father and mother and father. Honor your father and mother. Oh, yeah, but, but if, you, if you're dishonoring them for God's sake, that's okay. Say your father and mother aren't even Christians, aren't even believers, so yeah, it's okay to dishonor them. Jesus seems to think that whoever your father and mother are, you got to honor them. It might be challenging. It might be hard. It might be costly. But it's what we're commanded to do. 14 and 15, uh, again, Jesus called the crowd to him and said, listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. And we, we need to keep reading here because the whole thought continues. Verse 17, after he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Why are you so, are you so dull, he asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go for it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach, and then out of the body. And saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. Uh, he went on, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and defile a person. Okay, first, first thought I have here, first question is this whole thing about defiling. Uh, that's, that's vocabulary that's, that's pretty foreign to us these days. Old Testament, oh yeah, you have defilement, you have ritual impurity. That's something that because primarily what we see Jesus doing here, uh, I mean, like right there in, in verse 19, in saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. I mean, Jesus, by the way he operated, by what he focused on, by what he let the disciples get away with, was in a lot of ways setting aside this ritual purity that is so important in the Old Testament. And we, we might wonder sometimes, why does this subject that's so important in the Old Testament not feature centrally in Jesus's teaching. That's something to keep inquiring about. Then some of you are probably wondering, okay, here it is. He read 14 and 15, and he skipped to 17. Why did he skip verse 16? Well, if you look carefully at your Bible, depending on what translation you have, you may or may not have a verse 16. The translation of verse 16 in the Bibles that have it is something like, uh, let those who have hears, uh, those who have ears, let them hear. That's not in all the original text. We go to the oldest manuscripts, oldest Greek manuscripts of the New Testament. That verse isn't there. 
was added in and well it appears in some of the later texts that come in century two centuries or several centuries later uh, on the one hand if our approach to deciding what the actual text is is what the oldest manuscript says then yeah we're not going to include it this is a verse that we don't lose anything if it's not there because it's elsewhere in scripture it's it's a rhetorical flourish a rhetorical uh, device by which Jesus is saying, okay, guys, are you listening here? Are you paying attention? Are you letting this that I'm saying speak into your life? That's what Jesus is getting at here. Let's go on. Verse 19 here. How should we handle the end of verse 19, making all foods clean? Some modern versions treat this as a speech act, reflecting back on what Jesus has said. Thus, he is not merely describing. He's not just saying, okay, guys, all foods are clean. That's that's just the way it is. I mean, you look out there, you see that, you can tell that. But again, it's it's the translation here is as if Jesus is doing the speech act of declaring, of by saying this, that's what is happening. It's like in a wedding service when the person conducting the wedding says, I now pronounce to you, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, or I announce you are a husband and wife. It's in saying those words, it's in that declaration that it happens. Or we might say that in, in christening a ship, traditionally somebody breaks a bottle of wine or champagne uh, on the bow of the ship and they say, I christen you the USS Minnow or whatever the ship might be. It's that act, that speech act that makes it happen. So Jesus here in saying, don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and out of the body. I mean, he shows basic understanding of digestion here. But it's the center of the person is not the digestive tract. It's not what we eat. So what's in our heart? So what's, what's, what's from our soul? What's, what's from the inner part of our being? See that in the next question here. Uh, what is the connection between the heart and a person's lifestyle. I mean, we see these characteristics here, verse 21, 22, of a person's lifestyle. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery. I mean, we're pretty good at not doing those, right? I mean, we're, we're righteous, decent people as Christians today. Sexual immorality, no, 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 that's other people. Theft, uh, yeah, they're the ones that police arrest them, throw them in jail. Murder, oh yeah, that's really bad. Adultery, no, we don't do that around here. But, but some of these other ones here, Greed. Greed. Greed's one of those things that it's in our heart. Malice. See, plenty of malice on social media these days. Uh, you've had a big election yesterday. And the fallout continues today as the counting continues. Don't know when the counting will be, can, will be finished. Plenty of malice out there. Deceit. Uh, yeah, plenty of deceit. Plenty of saying one thing, doing another. Lewdness. Yeah, plenty of that. Envy. Oh, yeah, plenty of envy, plenty of us looking at the world, looking at other people and feeling in our hearts that they're getting the good things we deserve. Slander. Yep, plenty of slander. Arrogance, lots of arrogance and folly, foolishness. Yeah, just full of it out there. And unfortunately, too often full of it in here, in our hearts. Jesus' teaching here is that what's important is not what we eat, to what comes out of us as these things come out of us that shows defilement that shows uncleanness that shows our sin our brokenness our distance from god what can we do about these things i think a first step is recognizing that they're there setting aside our rationalization our justification our self-defense and admitting, Lord, yeah, that, the, that's in my heart. I recognize my heart is impure. I recognize the malice in my heart. I recognize the envy in my heart. I recognize my tendency to arrogance, to slander, to folly, to lust, to greed. Lord, I don't want that in my heart. I don't want that in my life. I don't want it coming out and spewing on the people around me. I want there to be a match between what I say when I say I give Jesus my allegiance. I trust 
in Jesus. I love Jesus. And these attitudes, these practices of my heart. So we give ourselves over to spiritual disciplines as we give ourselves over to Jesus entirely. We seek him to root all of these out, to remake us in his image. So here we are, this, this long, curious passage in, in Mark dealing with topics that aren't always on our first thoughts, the defilement, uncleanness. But the key thing I think that I see for us here is bringing into alignment our heart and our mouth, our profession, our confession, and the reality of where we are in our life with God. How are you doing today? How, how are those lining up in your life? Let's pray. Father, as you look into our hearts today, you see the impurity. You see the uncleanness. You see the many loves and allegiances that compete with our love for and allegiance for you that we often proclaim publicly and loudly. Today, Lord, root out anything in our heart that is not in line with you, that is not of you, so that we may represent you faithfully in a world that needs you desperately. Amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us for Bible study today. Uh, look forward to joining you next time. Bye.